Hello, I'm Debbie Scheller from A Likely Story Bookstore. We are excited to have you join us tonight for Imagine Your Story with our author, Jess Keating. All of Jess's books are available to purchase at A Likely Story Bookstore. You can call, come in, or order online at www.sykesvillebooks.com. And also remember to sign up for the summer reading program at the library, Carroll County Public Library's 2020 summer reading program, Imagine Your Story, is for all ages. It's an excellent way to engage the whole family in fun learning activities over the summer. Sign up at, carol, at library.carr.org. Jess Keating is a zoologist turned middle grade and picture book author. Jess has been sp um, sprayed by skunks, bitten by crocodiles, and been victim to the dreaded paper cut. <laughs> he has a master's degree in animal science and a growing collection of books that are threatening to overtake her house. She lives in Ontario, Canada, where she loves hiking, watching nerdy documentaries, and writing books for adventurous, funny kids. We are very excited to have you with us today, Jess. And what she's going to do, she's going to start by talking or reading a couple segments from her new book, Eat Your Rocks, Croc. And she's also <laughs> going to give us a sneak peek of her upcoming graphic novel that's going to come out this September. So here we're passing it over to Jess. And when we come back, we'll talk a little bit with her. Awesome. Thank you so much, Debbie. And hello to everybody watching. I believe there's a place for you on Facebook on the main page to ask us questions. I would love to hear from you. And in particular, I'd really love you to ask questions and get involved if you can. It is very, very strange being an author and doing these visits without kids and people in front of me. So I have to pretend you're all in front of me right now and really happy and excited to be here because I'm equally excited to be here with you today. So before I share just a handful of my very favorite animals from this book, I thought I would tell you a little bit about how it came to be. So as the lovely Debbie mentioned, I am an author, I am a cartoonist, which means I like to draw cartoons and put them into books, and I am also a zoologist. So many of you probably want to be a zoologist when you're older, but you might not even know what that word means. But a zoologist is somebody who studies animals. And before I became an author, I was a zoologist for many years and I love learning all about the amazing, amazing, amazing animals in this world. But what happened was, as I was learning about all these incredible animals, I really wanted to tell people about them. Because of course, uh, pretty much everybody out there loves some kinds of animals out there, but they need our help, right? This world is, is always changing and people are always kind of taking over habitats. And I wanted to make sure that all of the animals out there got the protection and help that they needed. So as I was learning about these animals, I knew it wasn't enough for me just to learn about them and keep that information myself. I wanted to put all of that information into books so kids could read about them and then learn to love the world as much as I did. So I've done books like this, is for blobfish. I have a whole series of five. Five of these are coming out. Um, I have done books like this that we'll talk about. I've done so many books about animals, but I'm always looking for new ways to describe these animals to you so that you can learn about them too. So my hope with this book, Eat Your Rocks Croc, which is also Dr. Glider's advice for troubled animals, and this is Dr. Glider, is that you kids can read this and you parents and teachers out there can read this and maybe learn a little bit together and hopefully you can pick your favorite animals and learn even more about them and then share all of that information with other people. So I'm going to assume that you're like, yes, I'm on board with that Jess Keating, right? And here we go. I will give you a few little inside peeks of this book. It came out in May, but because of the coronavirus, of course, Many bookstores were closed and many libraries were closed. My library here in Ontario is still closed and it is breaking my heart. But of course we do what we have to do. So many people have still not seen this book. But one of the coolest things about these picture books is, and the technical term for this is kind of funny, but it's called the undies. So if you look underneath a picture book that you buy, you can actually take off this little fancy dust cover here and you have what we call the undies. And this are the, these are the undies for Eat Your Rocks Croc. So we can see here, we have Dr. Sugar Glider. Here she is under the sea. Here she is getting ready to ski. Here she is looking like Tarzan swinging through the vines. Here she's about to work out. Let's see what's on the back here. 
We have scuba diving. We have a Sherlock Holmesian sugar glider. We have a very cute little glider and a donut and all sorts of fun stuff here. So that gives you a little hint. If you look at the endings of a book sometimes, you can have a hint of where you're going to go in the story and in the pages. So I thought I would read you just a few pages as we're getting going here. And then I know we're gonna have a little bit of a conversation. So this is the very first page when you open the book, these are the end pages. And in most picture books, there's a lovely, beautiful design here. And our book is no different. We have a nice look at Dr. Glider's medical office. Because again, this little lady here is a sugar glider, but she is also a doctor. She went to school to become a doctor because she wanted to help all of the animals in the world with their problems. So we can see here, we have a very unfortunate looking bear with a porcupine situation going on. We have an ostrich who seems to have a bit of a, maybe a stomach problem given the green there. We have, you can see up here, there's an x-ray. That dog looks to we have uh, eaten some keys. We even have a hippo and a bunny under here who seems to be having a bit of a problem. And this poor chap here is also not looking so well, but thankfully Dr. Glider is here to help. And a little secret about this book, if I can reveal these secrets, one of the jobs that I did before becoming an author and a zoologist who studied animals was working with animal rehab. So that means that I got to work with wild animals like this when they were sick or injured and then I would heal them all up as best as I can. And when they were better, we would release them back into the wild. So if you're wondering where the inspiration for so many of these animals came from, it is from my experiences like that. So I will read to you a few of my favorite spreads. Here's the inside cover. Eat your rocks crock, Dr. Glider's advice for troubled animals, written by me and the amazing Pete Oswald did the illustrations. So she says, Sugar gliders like me are nocturnal, but now that I'm a doctor, I help patients day and night. Ready to roll? Let's go. And you can see here, this poor little hummingbird has a sore beak. Dr. Glider. All right. So our first patient, make sure you can see her there, is Will the Beast, the Will the Beast. And this is in Maasai Mara, Kenya. So we are in Africa right now with this spread. And Will Deby says, Dr. Glider, my mom is already expecting me to be up and running across the plains. Can you tell her to chill? Those cheetahs get to lounge in their den all day. It's not fair. And here you can see the cheetahs just having a ball, lazing around. But poor Will and his mother need to get up and moving right away. And Dr. Glider says, sorry, Will, but your mom is right. The savanna is full of hungry animals. You want to eat breakfast, not be breakfast. Get moving. So that is probably not the advice that Will was hoping to hear. But in the sidebars here, we have a little comic section. If you kids like comics, this is the book for you because I love comics and graphic novels. And we were able to put fun little comics here. So let's get zooming for you so you can read it. And it says, some creatures have all the luck. They get lots of care and attention from their parents. These animals are known as altricial. And you can see that word is bolded, which means it's also in the glossary in the back of the book, because as a scientist, I love amazing, big, juicy words, and altricial is one of them. Humans, rabbits, marsupials, most rodents, and some birds are all altricial animals. So now you can go to your parents and your friends and say, you know what? Mom, dad, brother, sister, I am an altricial animal, and so are you. And that means that you need to get all sorts of care when you're younger. But do you think Will the Beast is like that? I'm afraid not. Other animals like Will the Beast, horses, ducks, and hares are called precocial. They are much more developed when they are born. So there's those animals there, and there's precocial. Precocial animals are able to move around right after they are born. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen a baby, like a horse or some of the animals on maybe some wildlife documentaries. You might've seen a giraffe being born or a gazelle being born or a wildebeest like this being born. But pretty much within about five or 10 minutes, 
those brand new baby animals are able to hop up and run along instantly. But have you ever seen a human baby hop up and run instantly? Of course not. And now you know why. It is because we are altricial and these animals are precocial. So that is one of my very favorites. And I do want to show you here. Here's our adorable little discovering the world outfit in Africa. And let's see where else we're going to head here. I will take you to, oh yes, okay. We are going from Kenya now to the South China Sea. And we are meeting Al Anglerfish. There he is there. You can see we have a nice little pun here. He's a very cute fish. And here is Dr. Glider. And you, you guys are not gonna believe what this anglerfish can do. Okay, so Al says, I'm so glad you're here, Doc. I am starving. There may be plenty of fish in the sea, but they're so hard to catch. Why am I so bad at hunting? I'm so hungry, I could faint. Uh-oh, so that's bad news. We have poor Al here. He is starving and he doesn't know what to do. You might think that Dr. Glider is going to say, well, go out and catch yourself some food. But guess what? That is not how these anglerfish survive. So here, Dr. Glider responds and says, Chin up, Al. I've got some great news. You don't need to hunt. You just need to find the nearest girl anglerfish and bite her. Trust me, you won't believe what happens next. Now, here is where I'm going to put all of you to the test because I will read you these sidebars and we will discover the truth behind the anglerfish's bite. But I want you to think to yourselves, do you think that Dr. Glider is asking Al to bite a girl anglerfish so that he can eat her? Or do you think it's something else, right? Because nature is not always what it seems. So I will tell you, here we go. Up here, there we go. Many male anglerfish don't hunt for food. Instead, they latch onto females to survive. Once a male fish bites a female, his body fuses with her and his internal organs wither away and become useless. He can then get his nutrients from her bloodstream. So think about that. Instead of eating food, he literally latches onto a female fish and then sucks up all the food from her bloodstream, which is craziness, but that is how these fish survive. And even cooler, you can see here we have a bunch of scientists. It took scientists centuries to realize that the lumps on some female anglerfish were in fact male fish. And down here you can see, she says, you're cramping my style, dude. And this is actually a really good scale of how big, this is the female fish here, there's her face. And this is the tiny little male anglerfish. So the males are so much smaller than the females. When they latch onto the females and bite them and stick to their skin, they are so small that they can just kind of look like little fishy warts. And scientists for centuries did not know that that's what they were looking at. They were actually looking at male anglerfish. In fact, it was so funny at the time that they really thought that there were maybe no male anglerfish out there, but it turns out they were just looking in the wrong place. They needed to look on top of a female anglerfish. So that is a very, very cool fact that you can share with all of your friends. The next time you're talking about being hungry, you can say, well, at least we're not anglerfish and have to bite onto other girls to get our food. Okay, let's see if we can pick something. Oh, here we go. Now, I'm sure that in the audience right now, there is somebody who loves platypus. Have you all seen a platypus before? They look like a maiduck, but now we are going to Australia. And then I think we'll move on. We'll get some questions after this or maybe have a bit of a chat. But this is one of my favorites because look at this adorable outfit on Dr. Glider, right? Just because you're a doctor doesn't mean you can't have fun on vacation. So this is what Patrick Platypus, who is in Victoria, Australia, is asking Dr. Glider. Hi, doctor. There's a family of humans that lives beside my pond. And no matter how much I hide, they're always trying to catch me. I'm feeling seriously helpless. 
So what do you think we can do if we're platypuses or platypodes? What should we do if a human is trying to come after us, right? Should we run away? Let's find out what Dr. Glider advises. She says, oh, Patrick, you may be cute, but you are far from helpless. Why haven't you used your secret weapon on them yet? You've got venom up your sleeve, or rather, your paw. That's right. These animals, platypuses, are actually venomous. The male platypus has a tiny little spur somewhere on his body, and we're going to find out. So up here we have, you can see the little picture here, he is right there. Male platypuses are equipped with a small spur on their hind legs. This spur can deliver venom when the platypus is attacked or scared. You've probably heard of venomous reptiles and fish, right? But platypuses are one of the few venomous mammals in the whole world. Platypus venom is strong enough to kill small animals, but it isn't lethal to humans. It will hurt a lot though. So lethal means it's going to kill somebody. If you were bitten by a platypus, I hope it never happens. Or if you were, sorry, spurred by a platypus's little tiny paw, you would not likely pass away from this injury, but it would not be very fun. So if you see a platypus, do you think you should chase him? No, probably not. You want to keep a good distance between yourself and the platypus. Because even though they are cute, you now know the truth. They have venom. And down here, we have a little baby platypus in an egg. Platypuses are also monotremes. Monotremes are very rare mammals because they lay eggs instead of giving birth to live young. So imagine this animal is not a lizard or a snake or anything like that. It is an adorable little mammal, but it is born in an egg. So that is a really, really quick look at this book. If you're interested, this is a picture of all of the animals in this book. We have the wildebeest that we saw. There's our platypus. We have a little black bean aphid. Of course, there's a crocodile, as is on the front cover. We have a shark, a bottlenose dolphin, a meerkat, some foxes, praying mantises. We even have a plant. And this plant, I'll give you a little spoiler, it eats rats. It is a plant that eats rats. So this is a book that I'm hoping is fun for anybody who loves animals or really just wants to explore the world. And right now, that is an extra special feeling, right? Because we are all pretty much locked inside and we can't really explore as we want to. We can't go outside as much as you want. But with a book like this, I'm hoping that it's a really fun chance to explore and you can learn a lot about the animals around you. And hopefully many of you out there will grow up to be authors or illustrators or zoologists or my personal favorite, put it all together and do all three. So that is my very quick look at Eat Your Rocks Croc. And I believe Debbie is now around and we can have a moment of chat and we can see what else we got going on today. That was so awesome. I did not know platypus were venomous. So right? it was amazing. Was <laughs> Thank you so much. I can't wait to finish the rest of the book. Thank you. Um, so exciting. And I'm sure it's going to be loved by teachers and by the school systems because boy, does that fit in a lot of, you know, STEM and, um, science um, books That's that awesome. we're always looking for. So I'm very excited about that. Um, one of the things that I found very interesting when I went to your website actually is a great quote that's on your website. And it says, you love to explore beautiful enchanting books that awaken the joy of curiosity. What a great statement to say. And your thank books you. definitely do that. Oh, um, and so let's start with Eat Your Crocs. Um, yeah. How did you, did you have a favorite animal? Did you have something that, I know that's probably as a zoologist, very <laughs> wild, but do you have a favorite animal or what was the favorite one to write about in your book? That is a great question. So you're very, you're very right. It is a lot like being asked, who is your favorite child? It's like kind of like, or who is your favorite book that you've written? Um, my very favorite animal I have actually not put in a book yet which it, I know it's one, I almost feel like you feel so strongly about it, like you've got to find the very right project. And I imagine there's a lot of people in our audience today who share this favorite animal. But my very favorite animal on the planet is the wolf. And one of the reasons I love them so much is because I think they deserve it. 
I mean, everybody's heard of the, you know, the big bad wolf and wolves are always treated and presented as these awful vicious creatures, very similar to sharks. And my, my book, Shark Lady is kind of similar in tone where because we have these horrible reputations for these animals, they're really, really mistreated. So all my life I've loved wolves, but in this book, honestly, I hate to say, but one of my favorite animals is actually Dr. Glider. If, if anybody, uh, like you're watching this on the internet right now, so when we wrap up here, you should Google a picture of what a sugar glider looks like because they are the most, they're just so adorable. And then when you can imagine, you know, our little sugar glider with a little, you know, a stethoscope and stuff. But um, yeah, you, you can't really beat an adorable animal who also wants to see. And they're it. very tiny also. They are, they're super tiny and they're, they're oh, they're so, they're so cool. <laughs> And Dr. Sugar Glider, how did you come up with her to be the dog? How did you, was that just, just, just popped into your imagination? That, that is a fair question. How on earth did that happen? Honestly, um, I grew up watching a lot of, as you can imagine, like wildlife documentaries. And you guys were probably from the, you know, Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter. Um, up here in Canada, we had the Krat brothers. I'm not sure if that's that's a thing down there, but it was a, a team of brothers who went around the world traveling, looking at animals. Oh, the crap. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. They Chris were crazy. <laughs> yeah. Now they have, I think it's when I was younger, it was um, it was uh, just called Kratz Creatures. But right. now, of course, it's wild Kratz. They've turned themselves into animated because they're perhaps a little older than they right. were. <laughs> you know, they're wonderful. I adore them. Um, <laughs> but when I was growing up, I had all of these amazing influences watching these these really cool people explore the world but none of them were female for starters. And I thought that, you know, I wanted to be somebody who represented all sorts of things for all sorts of people. So even though this book is not about a female human exploring the world, I was certain I wanted Dr. Sugar Glider to be a female character. And she is extremely smart, like most women are. She's extremely driven and ambitious and has very, very big dreams. So when it came down to choosing a character, I, the, the idea of a sugar glider popped into my head first and I just had this picture of her wearing glasses, you know, with the stethoscope and the coat and being so dwarfed in size. That, I mean, this little tiny doctor up here treating all of these creatures. It was, it was too good to pass up. So that's how that came to be. That is awesome. That is, I also want to remind everybody in the audience, please type in your questions on the chat bar in Facebook so we can get um, just to answer any of your questions tonight. Um, almost all of your books, um, and I might say all of them have animals in them. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Well, I mean, humans are animals too, so they all definitely have Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you write both fiction and nonfiction. Yes. Um, what she has, Jess, I wanted to also point out that this is another new book that just came out on June 30th. It's a beautiful book on Ocean Speaks, and it's about Marie Tharp, who... Um, she revealed the ocean's biggest secret um, in this beautiful, beautiful book. She's written um, some that she had showed you. She, and this is a middle grade chapter series called The Elements of Genius about, and the main character is Nikki Telsa, which is also a fabulous series. And if you can see the covers, there's also animals in this. <laughs> uh, and this is your fiction series. Yep. Um, so, but you're... Shark Lady, you, which you also mentioned, is another nonfiction. Do you just um, find these things and decide that would be a great story to tell, or how do you come up with your stories? Um, I I have been working in science for, I mean, most of my life and all of my adult life. I've always loved animals and I've always loved stories of inspiring people. So I began writing in fiction. Like I told, my first series was called uh, My Life is a Zoo. And it was about a little girl who lived in a zoo and she was kind of coming to terms with finding her voice. But since then, I pretty much keep an open catalog, you know, on my phone and in notebooks about everything that kind of prompts my curiosity. And actually that's one of the, one of the top tricks that I like to teach parents and teachers is to have a, a piece of paper on the wall or some, you know, a notebook for their kids. And at the top, you just write one amazing thing. And your only job for that book is to pay attention all day. And if one really cool thing piques your curiosity or makes you go, ooh, that's really neat, you write it down in that book. And that is what I've been doing for years. So that is how pretty much all of my books have, have started. They've all started because some little tiny thing piqued my interest. 
And it's a wonderful way, you know, when we're talking about teaching writing or reading with kids, like let them read about and write about what they love. That's all you need to do. And, and that one amazing thing exercise is a wonderful way to, to kind of keep track of everything we love. And what came first? Did you have the passion for zoology and writing came after oh. or was it a combination? How did, how did you end up where you are now? <laughs> like, how did you figure that out? Yeah, um, I am admittedly like what I do, the, the fields that I mix together was not the norm for me. Um, my first love, I, I would have to say, is probably equal parts nature and animals and reading and writing. It's just, I was younger when I was, you know, you can look at animals in the world before you can read and write, I think. Um, but I have always loved the combination of those two things. I, when I see something amazing, it's not enough for me just to see it. Like if I see orca whales in the wild in Iceland or something, that's an experience I had not too long ago. It's not enough for me just to have that experience. I really feel like it's not complete until I share it somehow. So I started school and I did, uh, I took zoology by, you know, all the way through, I got a master's in zoology, learned a lot of stuff. And then about that time when I was starting to think, okay, what do I actually want to do with my life? I had all of this stuff in my head and this knowledge in my head that really it was already there for me to kind of channel into books. And like I mentioned in my opening, like I think, I think kids especially just do such amazing things with their knowledge that I just wanted to be a small part of inspiring them. And, you know, really I want to lead by example and hopefully teach people that all the things you love to do, you don't have to pick. And that's one question that I, you know, I still hear people say it to kids and I know they mean well, but like, what do you want to be when you grow up? It, I remember being really stressed about that question because I didn't want to pick one thing, right? I wanted to do all the things that I love somehow. And so you are doing that. That's awesome. I mean, most of them, like I still have not become a mermaid yet or like all these things yet. <laughs> but, you know, I think there's a way to kind of mix together your life, whatever you're passionate about. That's enough. Like knowing that is enough. So I'm hoping that kind of mixing all these things together, people can see, all right, you can you can do this stuff. It's, it's OK. With your writing, what has been the most surprising thing that has happened while you've been writing a story? Oh, God. Uh, well, you want the truth. Okay, I'm going to scoot over here for a moment. I do not have it on me, but the third book in this series, this series here, the Elements of Genius series, the most surprising thing that happened is I wrote the third book and it came out actually two days ago yep. and it's called Nikki Tesla and the Traders of the Lost Spark. And get this, it is about the team. It's a bunch of geniuses reimagined from history, Leonardo da Vinci and such. The team has to fight a viral pandemic plague. And you wrote this. These, yes. You might want to explain that this yes. was way before the Years pandemic. Years ago. Yeah. Right. When you write a book, like if you, if I, if this came out today, that means I was writing it two and two and a half years ago. So this book that I wrote about a virus. And how do we save the world as kids from these from this virus? I wrote long, long, long time ago, and it came out in a pandemic. So you're psychic so, too. I, I <laughs> apparently I'm psychic. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that that means the Dr. Sugar Glider is going to knock on my door any minute now, right? Right. <laughs> and now I realize I should have put masks on all of them, in all the pictures. But I digress. Yes, that one of the most surprising things is that, and another really surprising thing is just how far-reaching. I mean, some of these stories can be like, it's amazing to meet readers who are inspired by, you know, Shark Lady or, or any of the, the people or animals that I'm talking about. It's, it's amazing how stories and facts can work together in such a way to inspire people. So I, I, I'm very too. It's, it's, it's something yeah. that entertains people, which is great. Yeah, um, I hope so. You, men <laughs> you mentioned that you like to travel yes. and you've yeah. been to many different places. What are some of the places that you've been to that you've seen these animals and um can you tell us the most interesting place that you've been to with Absolutely. animals um two of my favorite places and of course nobody can travel now so we're li i'm living vicariously through these memories uh one of the first places i went to when i was able to was new zealand which was absolutely it was if you again if, when you're done here go google new zealand or you know ask me questions about new zealand because it is it's such a beautiful place and if you have seen the Lord of the Rings movies or the Hobbit movies, you can understand, like, 
it actually looks like that. And I was lucky enough to see a kiwi bird there, which is this kind of little adorable, it looks like a kiwi fruit, like it looks like a little furry blob and has a long beak. And they are so shy and nocturnal that most people never get a chance to see them. So I was very lucky about that. Wow. And I would say the second place I visited that has just never left me was Iceland. And I was able to see three different pods of orca whales, like jumping and spy hopping out on the Arctic Ocean. And the funny, th well, it's not funny. It's kind of funny now because we're fine. But that particular day, there was a storm on the Arctic Ocean and we ended up being out in it. And I remember thinking like, I'm either going to fall into the Arctic Ocean and that will be it. Or we're going to see something cool because whales don't care when it's stormy. Right. So wow. thankfully, whales were really happy to be playing around. And I saw these amazing orca whales. They were just, oh, it was, it was incredible. So those oh, that's, were amazing. that's yeah, amazing. It was amazing. If you can get out to, to Iceland or New Zealand when all this is over, save your pennies like I did. It's a, definitely worth going. Um, your books are illustrated by many different people. Yes. And you are also an illustrator. I, um, I try. <laughs> Um, who chooses the illustrator? Do you get a choice in that? Um, oh, that's a great question. So a really good example is this book here. This one, and I use this as an example because the illustrator happens to be one of my very favorite illustrators. And I can show you, this is one of my favorite illustrations from this book. Aww. So this is also a book about an amazing scientist. Her name is Marie Tharp, and she mapped the ocean floor with these. I mean, you can see it's, it's just, it's stunning, but I actually am very lucky in that I get some say and input into the type of illustrations I like. Typically what happens is I will present a publisher, like I will say, here are the words, and then we will all sort of brainstorm and say, okay, what, what do we picture for this book? Do we picture, you know, really flowy illustrations? Like, you know, this is a good example. Like it's very, it looks like the water that we're talking about, or do we want something more maybe cartoony, like this type of book? And we will have kind of a conversation with all of these, oh, dropped one, with all of these, uh, with all these people and editors, and we will kind of land on some concepts. And we think, okay, maybe watercolor or really bright or and then the fun part is looking around online and looking at people's portfolios and their Instagram pages. And then we all come to guest station and then we see what happens. We see who's available. We see, you know, who would like to do this work. We get some input from designers and it, it takes a long time sometimes, but uh, it is one of the most amazing parts of the process because that's when it starts to become our book. You know, like it's just a word document when I'm looking at it and I have these ideas of what it could be. But when you get an artist involved and you start to see, you know, worlds like this come to life, it's, it's incredible. Um, how do you pick which animals you're going to write about? Like you have so many in this one. Yeah. <laughs> how did you? I mean, and you have to limit it because there's only so many pages you're allowed to have. Yeah. So how did you it's, choose these? It's it's actually really tough when I have to cut an animal, and I mean, for this is a good example. So in this book, there's uh, this is some of the other books in the series. We've got what makes a monster cute as an axolotl and gross as a snot otter. I'm allowed 17 animals in these books. And when I have to cut an animal, I actually feel guilt. Like, I feel like the animal's like going to email me and be like, what the heck? Like, was I not amazing enough? You know, and a lot of them, again, they need conservation help. They need that sort of awareness. So I try to pick animals that I'm going to be doing a lot of, you know, impact helping them, but also ones that are going to be just completely amazing. I mean, you can't, who can deny that face? That's awesome. <laughs> like a blobfish is something to behold. And whether you're, you know, like six or, yeah, whether you're six or 60, like you're going to remember that face. So it's very hard to pick which animals. But luckily, I have other books that I'm working on. So if I can't put them in one, I try to put them in another somehow. <laughs> so you have a new graphic novel coming out in September. It's very exciting. Would you be willing to read a little portion of it to give a sneak peek? And then we'll get to questions after that. How does that sound? Perfect. Okay. So very quickly, because I know we're probably running short on time here. This is a look at Bun Bun and Bon Bon. We have the very first page here. When Bun Bun met Bon Bon. 
So you can see it's a beautiful sky, a little bit of wind in the air. Maybe there's a change afoot. We have Bun Bun had it all. A delightful Bun Bun nose, a winning Bun Bun smile, a ridiculously cute Bun Bun tail, and not one but two adorable Bun Bun ears. But there was one thing Bun Bun didn't have. What do you think it is? Bun Bun didn't have a friend. Uh-oh. So he says, hello, leaf, talking to the little leaf. Hello, clouds. Hello, flowers. Hello, pond. Hello, stick. Hello, bird. But then bird flies away. Goodbye, bird. Bun Bun's very sad because Bun Bun does not have a friend until one day. Hello, rock. Are you talking to me? And then Bun Bun is shocked. Who said that? And Bun Bun is looking all around. Who do you think it is? Over here. Where? Here. Where? Here. I don't see you. And then, hi. Whoa, a talking hook. I am not. You are so. I can hear you with my spectacular ears. I'm talking, but I'm not a rock. And then, can't, can't you tell? I have a purple candy shell, a sugary candy body, and not one but two sparkling candy eyes. And then, oh my carrot, a talking candy. He says, technically, I'm a bonbon. A bonbon? I'm a bun bun. Wait, what's a bon bon? It's a fancy type of candy. Wow, that is fancy. Do you have a bow tie? Someone fancy should have a bow tie. And then, oh, as a matter of fact, I have two, Team Fancy. So that is the way these two meet. We have the Bun Bun, the adventurous bunny who does not have a friend. And of course, every Bun Bun needs a Bon Bon buddy, which is this little guy right here. Beautiful striped little Bon Bon. And this book is coming out September 1st. And here's the back cover. We have little Bun Bun and Bon Bon doing the world together. And I'm really excited for people to meet them because I mean, it's my very, very first graphic novel and I have grown up reading and loving graphic novels. You've probably seen many graphic novels with this little red bar here where the graphics, a lot of the really amazing graphic novels are published by those people. So it was wonderful to get a chance to make my own final. That's so exciting. We're very happy. We can't wait till it comes out. Oh, thank and you. I just let everyone know you can pre-order that. If you would like to get that on the day it's released, just pre-order it order it with us, you can call, come on in, or order it on our website. Um, so we have some questions from the audience today. Um, Riley is asking if you have any pets. Oh, Riley, that is a great question. I currently do not have pets. And I know it's actually a disappointment to me too, because I love animals so much. But the thing is, before this coronavirus stuff happened, I traveled all the time. So I didn't think it was right if I had a pet and I had to leave them at home all the time, right? They would be really lonely. So I'm looking forward to the day when I can finally get myself a big old dog or something like that. I love dogs and I would love to have a dog. Good question, Riley. Um, our friend Teresa says hello and good evening. Um, Sandra would like to know how small is a sugar glider? Oh, a sugar glider is quite small. They could fit on your shoulder or in your pocket. Gives you a good <laughs> a little good metric. <laughs> Yeah, a little baby pet, yeah. <laughs> and Tom would like to know what other animals are in New Zealand? Oh my gosh, in New Zealand, it's interesting. So most places on the planet have what we call like mammalian predators. So mammals like us, but they're mammals that eat 
other animals. So, you know, Africa has lions. Uh, we in North America have, you know, bears and wolves and things like that. But in New Zealand, there are actually not a lot of big predators like that. So it's very safe. If you're out in the world in the wild in New Zealand, it's very, very safe. But they do have many different types of birds and insects and stuff like that. And I think, oh, you know who else I believe lives in New Zealand? Well, besides the hobbits, of course, from the Hobbit movies, there are many different types of beetles, which maybe doesn't sound that interesting, but beetles are one of the most amazing animals or amazing species, types of species of animals on the planet, because I think they actually make up 80% of all life on the planet. Don't quote me on that, but it's around there. Most of the animals on the planet are beetles. So there are a lot down there in New Zealand. There is an animal called a weta. If you look it up, it's W-E-T-A, which I actually wanted to put in a book, but I just had to cut it from a book. And it is a giant beetle, a giant, giant beetle. So lots of really cool animals in New Zealand. Good question. That is awesome. Um, Kim says her favorite animal is a panda bear, just to let you know. Thank you, Kim. Pandas are amazing. <laughs> Penny is asking, if you could travel anywhere that you haven't been, where would you go? Can I travel back in time? Sure. I, I think I would love to meet like an actual dinosaur. Now, so here's a little a fact for everybody. Birds, our birds that we see around in the world today, they are technically dinosaurs. So the dinosaurs did not all go extinct. Birds are dinosaurs, but I want to see like a big giant, you know, a brontosaurus or a T-Rex. I would love to see a dinosaur. A T-Rex? Really? Yeah, I would, <laughs> oh yeah, the bigger, the better, the toothier, the better. I would love to see a real dinosaur. So um, I would go back in time. <laughs> um, John would like to know what animal would you most like to observe in the wild? Oh, oh, that's so tough. Um, I think it would be neat to observe some sharks like to be underwater like again be a mermaid perhaps i would love to be underwater and see some you know sharks in the wild like for a long time just to follow them along. or a like a blue whale something absolutely massive because we know so little about these animals even though they're giants we know so little about them it would be very cool to just kind of hang on to a blue whale's you know fin and just kind of travel along as they did their thing Good question. And Lisa would like to know what animal has surprised you the most? Oh my gosh. What? Okay. I have it here actually. One of the animals, I can't pick a, the number one, but one of the animals that has surprised me the most is this little guy right here. Oh, that's an animal. <laughs> this is a pink armadillo. And he is in this book, Biggest Bird Blobfish, if you're interested. And the very, very cool thing about these guys is how they are seen so rarely that there are people that have studied these animals for 30 years straight and they have never, ever seen them in the wild. The wow. only time I have seen one of these, and I'm not one of these people who have studied them for 30 years, but I, I think they're amazing, so I wanted to learn about them. I've only been able to see one in a museum, like a taxidermied version of these animals and they could fit in your shoe they're so wee but they are the coolest coolest strangest little creatures i absolutely love them and the neat thing about them here you can cut that this is the front half <laughs> it's hard to tell and this is the back half these animals have what is technically known as a butt plate a butt plate so what they do is they use that butt plate to push dirt as they're moving around so it's actually a really cool adaptation. But again, when you tell kids about a butt plate, they always want it. They always want to know more. <laughs> they love it. So we're going to close up now. I just want to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you, Jess. This was wonderful. And we want you to know, eat your crocs. Eat your rocks, crocs. We have Ocean Speaks, Element of Genius, all of Jess' books are available at the library as well as at a Likely Story bookstore. So please stop in. And you know the library is now open for curbside pickup. So you can go online and um, pick up some, you know, order some books and you can go in and pick them up um, by appointment though, please. And a Likely Story is also open. You may can't come in, but make sure you have a mask on, please. So thank you, Jess. This was a wonderful event. Your books are fantastic and we loved having thank you. Thank you. Tonight. 
Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Lisa. You're awesome. Stay safe. Thank you.